Good day, everyone. Well, uh, as we see, we're um, getting the uh, pullback in the markets. Uh, it seems like the markets have a natural rhythm where they they pull in anywhere between uh, three to five percent every uh, every month or every couple months or so. And uh, you know, today's news was you know not, not particularly uh, onerous. You know, you, you did have three things that stacked up against the market. Um, you know, with Spain getting hit pretty hard. It's tied to um, Latin America, and then you also had uh, some earnings that were off a little bit, and um, and then of course China, China's uh, manufacturing sector. Um, but this is these are not really worrisome news items. Um, so it it seems almost like uh, you know at, at some point uh, the markets could become um, ripe for uh, for plucking in terms of getting into um, the right stocks at the right time. We know that uh, the right stocks tend to pull down uh, three to four times what market averages do on these little mini corrections. So right now I have the S&P off um, a little over 2%, and you know it could go lower. It tends, it tends to correct, uh, like I said, anywhere between uh, three to five percent each time. So you know maybe we have another one or two percent in the correction, and then uh, when the markets find find their footing. Uh, then uh, that is also reflected in leading stocks, which probably if the market sells off, say, 3 or 4% from their peaks, um, and like I said, that's only 1 or 2% away, then these major uh, leading stocks often will get clocked anywhere between uh, twice that if they're a big, big cap stock, or uh, four times that if they're smaller, um, you know, usually with under, under $10 billion market cap, so more of the mid-cap variety. And uh, you can take a look at stock like YY, that uh, you know they shot straight up and then they shoot straight back down and just earlier today the thing was off uh, something like 16 percent off its peak and so the losses uh, happened very quickly so it's important to be nimble in this market um, of course the other way to play it is in a slower style where you're using using the 10 50 day moving averages as your selling guide and you, you know you're employing the seven week rule and there are some stocks uh, not very many unfortunately but there are some stocks that have obeyed that rule, and then you would still be in those stocks, and possibly with a fairly sizable position um, if you held it for a number of months without getting uh, stopped out of the position. Um, it all depends on your trading personality. Um, our trading personality, well, Gills especially, he likes to uh, get in and get out very quickly, and he goes in with size. And this kind of market, it can do very well. I mean, he was he did extraordinarily well last year, which is one of the toughest years on record um, using using that method. But again, it's not my style, and, and uh, therefore um, I would be foolhardy to, to, uh, to try to, um, say, re readjust my trading personality um, just because a different method um, happens to be very profitable. I have, I have my own style, and, and last year was a pretty good year for me. It wasn't, wasn't as good as Gills, but that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm happy with my performance so far, and um, if you're not happy with your performance, I would suggest uh, either, if, if you know that your method's good um, and your strategy's sound, it just could be the market tone. Um, you know, some years you're not going to make money, um, and especially with the markets where they are right now, uh, with all this QE manipulation going on, we're very in very unprecedented times. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying your hand out. You know, say take 10% of your portfolio and try Gill's method, or try my style, try, try different styles to see how that suits your trading personality. Because you know, there's uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, being a perma student, as I like to call it, and developing uh, or sharpening uh, your existing tools in your tool shed. Um, and the markets will always throw us a new curveball. I mean, that's what they've been known to do for decades now. Except this particular curveball called quantitative easing happens to be particularly pernicious and fast and uh, and quite curvy. So you know you have to adapt to the environment, and um, and that's that's a big part of investment success. If you can't adapt, there's nothing wrong with sitting it out, sitting on the bench for a few innings, and because um, it's important to preserve your investment psychology. You know, if you get beat up and you have all of a sudden you're looking at a 40% drawdown, that, that could be very disheartening, and, and that's another part of investing. successful investing is making sure you don't, you don't let that go to your head where you start then um, moving away from your strategy into no man's land, which can only make things worse. Um, so always approach the market in a systematic way that, well, that works with your trading personality, um, and then you're more likely to um, have winning years than, than, than not. Gil? Yeah, I say short the crap out of this market. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, that, yeah, I guess that was yesterday, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's some. I mean, there are some things you could short this morning. I thought LinkedIn uh, coming up uh, into the you know this 
50-day, 65-day exponential confluence. You can see all these moving averages I draw. I, I like this because you can you can see that it's finding resistance in a variety of places. So it looks very weak to me. It looks like it wants to break down. We'll see what happens. But the key was get you know you saw if you saw it go past the 50-day and it gets to the 65-day around 220. That, that's where you can jump all over it and then use a tight stop. You know, and uh, to me that's it's still a short sale target after this pocket pivot. And, uh, you know, the one thing we missed, I think, Dr. Hitt, at the time uh, of this pocket pivot here, uh, six trading days ago on this chart, is that you actually had this pocket pivot occurred after a V-shaped wedging rally. Look at the volume from here to here declines on the buy side as you're getting bigger uh, downside volume bars. And then you get the pocket pivot. So the reality is this is probably just an a improper pocket pivot, you know. And I think... I'm going to be right back. Sure, go ahead. be right back. Um, you know, and so you pull back into the 50-day, maybe it becomes viable, this helps correct it, but my view is if it's breaking here and it can't really get going, then I'll try it on the short side. And so far that's working. You know, but, uh, if you were on the chat room yesterday, we were looking at course as a short, but it's past the 65-day the, uh, exponential. This morning it was down over a buck, now it's pretty much, uh, well, it's down about 24 cents right now. But this morning, uh, it looked like it was going to roll over, but now it's turning back up for the 50-day. I'm just kind of hanging back. I had a position yesterday. I just covered it real quick. I think I made a nickel on the position. But uh, it looks to me like it's headed to the 50-day at least. And th this looks like sort of a rolling top. You know, on the weekly, maybe left shoulder, and here's your head. And now you're forming a right shoulder now. So I'd keep an eye on this one as a possible short sale target. So um, let's see. Looks like we don't have any questions yet. Is that right? Let me see. No, here's some questions. Um, but my basic view here is uh, the market's got some issues here. And one of the signs for me is that, you know, I look pretty smart. I have to say, you know, owning stocks like YY and Workday and trading these on the way up. And they, they've all had some nice moves. But the last couple of days have made me look kind of stupid. And so my general rule is when the market starts to make you look or feel stupid, then you might want to, you know, stand up and take notice. Uh, because the bottom line is when you look smart in the market, the market's making you look smart. It's not that you're necessarily smart. Um, although I'm sure if any of you asked your mothers, they would give you a different answer. But in any case, my view is that the market makes you smart or stupid, and you have to listen to when it's, it's telling you you're smart, you're on the right track, but all of a sudden things shift and it starts telling you you're stupid, I think you just take notice. My view was just whatever positions I had yesterday, uh, just blew them out right at the opening, just like Portfolio Simulator Dude did. And I think you can see that that was a smart thing uh, for him to do. Uh, and I think if anybody comes into the market a little bit late, and I think if you're looking at entering the market on a fresh basis, uh, you know, just this last week, and in... You know, over the weekend, IBD had the uh, front page story of the uh, CEO of TD Ameritrade talking about, you know, gleefully how the, the retail investor is back in this market. It's like, yeah, okay, well, they finally showed up. That's probably the top. Um, and maybe that's what's going on here. But I would have to say what's going on right now, you can see very clearly, NASDAQ's breaking down. It's 4190 was support at the top of this level here. It's going through it. So it's going through support. Maybe that means it's going to head for these lows, and that would take you to the 50-day. That's a possible uh, scenario. Okay, so the, you know that's and it, that's, and it tends to, by the way, hit the 50-day quite often. It does because I mean, it did it here. So here we only get right, and so you know you let this go through. Uh, well, here's the whoops. Let's go take a look at the uh, Nasdaq here. See if I can make it bigger. Um, There, make it a little easier to see. Here's a 50-day. It doesn't get quite close enough there. Uh, let's see. Just watching LinkedIn go lower. You know, uh, gold's looking pretty decent, too. But I'm already long a pile of physical gold from the 300 area, so I don't really feel like I have to step in and buy this. But uh, it is starting to turn. But, yeah, you do, you do get these pullbacks. But you notice we are breaking support. And so that means maybe we're coming down. And for my money, it's just either try a couple of short positions here if something is in the right position to to be uh, to short it, such as I thought the LinkedIn. Uh, and maybe Coors will set up here. I'd keep a close eye on that. Um, 
pay no attention to the quote screen behind the curtain. I know people get want to know what the heck's on there, but nothing really that special. Not today, that's for sure. Um, okay, so you know what we're looking at here. Also, breaking support here. Uh, I'm gonna say around 1811, 1810 on the S&P. So you know, looking and you're going through the 50-day, but that puts you in a position, I think, to undercut these lows, which would put you through the 50-day and get everybody really bearish. Uh, you know, the investors' intelligence still showing a lot of bullishness. And uh, I think that the, the, when you see that, okay, you know the market's set up for a correction or even a top, but you don't really have to do anything until you start to see evidence that that's happening. So here we go again. We get the the sell off. Is the volume heavier today, uh, Dr. K? Let me check. This was pretty heavy, so I, I don't think it's heavier today. But let me see. I here. think on the uh, NYSE. Let, let's see. You guys can probably okay, hear. We are yeah, uh, higher, slightly higher, higher, slightly higher, higher volume on the on the Nasdaq and higher 10 on the Nasdaq. percent on the NYSE, and those numbers are actually increasing. So I think you're heading lower. So, but anyways, it makes sense because you know these corrections tend to be a little bit deeper than where they're at right now, and, if, and the S and P tends to undercut the 50 days just enough to put everyone in the panic mode. Right. And the Nasdaq itself tends to um, hit the 50 day after the S and P, but it too can undercut for a day or two which adds to the sense of panic and urgency. I mean, it did that in April, it did that in April of last year, June of last year, um, October of last year. So it's almost like a routine um, rhythm in the markets to do that. Yeah, and we'll see if the rhythm maintains. All I know is right now what I'm seeing is a shortable market, so the you know, last couple of days, so that's how I'm playing it. Now, the key uh, to my success last year was not getting caught in a rigid point of view and really not paying too much attention to the indexes per se, but watching stocks as well. So a lot of these things coming in, you know, Workday is one of my favorite stocks down in here. It broke out, ran up. Now we're coming into the 20-day, or maybe you undercut this low, or maybe you come all the way back to the top of the base. But this is probably a longer-term leader and a stock I'm keeping an eye on. I know everybody's all excited about Netflix. My guess is you'll see it uh, pull back and undercut the low of the viable gap up day yesterday, and it's just going to come in. It's pro probably not going to launch out of here right away, I don't think, especially with the market being a little bit weak. Um, let's see. What else has been acting strong? Um, let's look at well, – we looked at the cores. Oh, I was going to mention what, before I got that call about LinkedIn was um, kind of a tricky – quite a tricky one. I didn't hear what you said about it, but I, I just wanted – if you if you didn't already comment. Um, well, the, you had a wedging – you had a V-shaped wedging rally before the pocket pivot, and you can see the wedging uh, volume where you also – where you have lighter upside volume is declining on the way up, and, and the, the uh, red bars are a little bit higher. So, you know, to me that's saying uh, – you're wedging here, and then you have the pocket pivot, and it fails, but, and you have. But to... one could play the devil's advocate and say that okay. it undercut the 200 day, and right. then it well, yeah, bounced, I mean, it bounced right through it on volume, fair, fairly substantial volume, especially for um, right you know, the, the size of the company, and then it comes to the 50 day on another big volume bar. So that this, this is a great case where you've got some pros and cons that are almost in equal balance, and then you say, well, you know, LinkedIn is it a leader? It's it's made some good moves in the past, and then you know you start weighing everything, and you say, well, you know, this is a possible stock. But again, you're right. I mean, there there are some there's some negative qualities like that that bounce after it came to the 200 day. It didn't really carry on. It had some resistance in there. Yeah, but and you can see what what LinkedIn had three waves of selling in the base, and that that will set up a rally as I see it, and that's exactly what you got. But it but it was capped off with what I see as an improper pocket pivot, and I think in hindsight. You can say this was an improper pocket pivot because it's failing as we speak. And you look well, at the definition. Week, any any week, pocket, pocket pivot that uh, fails is going to be improper. But right. Well, but you could. But I think you could see it ahead of time. I think you could have seen it ahead of time, and I don't think we were paying attention. To, to be honest with you. Um, well, I, I mean, for for the purposes of investors' education, I mean, in terms of you know where they're at and when someone sizes up. You know, it's important to know, okay, what are the pros and what are the cons, and then they have to weigh them. You know, they're going to see some stocks maybe we're not going to put out in a report because right. it's not our type of stock, but they right. might see something that's, say, a slower moving, and it has an equal number of pros and cons, and then they have to figure out, do they want to play it? And if they do, maybe they only go in with half a position. Right. Well, I, I admit I tried buying this, and I ended up, I mean, I think I talked about this last week. I, I tried buying it, seeing if it would work, because in the QE market, who knows? You know, at the very least, my feeling was, if you buy it close to the 50-day and it doesn't hold, then you could always reverse your position and uh, and go short the thing. So, 
you know, but I think the other thing to look at here is if you look at this pattern, I mean, this looks like a left shoulder, you got a head, and then a right shoulder that's a little higher. So it is starting to look like a, a little bit like a rolling top. You have a pickup in volume here, and you close, eh, not quite mid-range, so I don't know if you'd see that as support, but last week you did stall out on the weekly chart, and, and having studied a lot of these examples from the past, on a right shoulder, if you start to see this sort of stalling action, uh, that can tell you that it's going to roll over. So right now it's coming in, it's below the 50-day. My view is I'm short the stock using the 50-day now at 220 as my stop. But I might yeah, scalp, also, scalp it. If you um, look at the weekly on it, um, from, since, the, since it peaked at 257, that, um, that formation is it's a weakness because yeah. it's wide and loose. Yeah, so it's exactly. not consolidating like it should. I mean, it go, comes into the 200-day, but after being fairly sloppy, and then it continues to be sloppy. So uh, it needs to get see. tighter in here before, before it can be uh, Right, and before it goes higher. And for all we know, after earnings, it blows up. You know, who knows? I mean, Netflix looked like it was in trouble, and then you got this earnings announcement, and they rammed it uh, to the upside. But my, I'm guessing it's going to come in a little bit here. Um, I, I noticed this morning on an intraday basis getting some resistance around the 390 level, so I put out a short position there. I don't know. How, I mean, I'm, you know, it's coming in now, and we'll see how this uh, acts. But it, to, to me, that's just a tactical short. Um, and I'm not going to get into why I did it because a lot of yes, and everybody's going to start asking me about my rules and this and that. I know I've, I've often cited the ugly duckling theory, and of course that always brings in emails that would I please discuss the rules of the ugly duckling theory. <laughs> there are no rules. The ugly duckling theory is a state of mind, and uh, it's looking to be opportunistic in a QE market. And so a lot of times it means when things get ugly, if they start to show some signs of, of stabilizing uh, in this market, you've been able to go long. And some of the best moves have occurred on the market turns. You know, if you go back, I remember as soon as I came out of the hospital uh, in August, we had the shakeout. And this was a great move uh, to get long, things like Yelp. Then you had another break, and then if you saw stuff in here and you got long in here, boom, things took off. And the best moves occur uh, from, the, from the lows up into a new high, at which point the market seems to run out of steam and gets a little bit choppy. And you see the same things occurring over and over again. So it's pretty interesting that uh, you know, that's been the approach, and, and there's no real rules other than looking at using some different types of buying techniques, buying things on weakness uh, into logical areas of support, trying to gauge when the market is reaching a panic mode on the downside. Uh, and there's no real rules, you know. It's like somebody asked me yesterday on the, in the chat room, uh, you know, in this market, do you take your 100% of your initial position? What? 100% of my initial position? It's, I guess someone's asking that somehow in my mind I have this idea that I'm going to take a position that's size X. And if there are some conditions like the moon is not in the seventh house, it's in the sixth house, and Jupiter Jupiter is not aligned with Mars, but actually Mercury, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to only buy 50% of my initial position. But I, I don't really operate that way. Um, if I think stocks are going up, I'll go in very heavy. If I think they're going down, I'll short them heavily. It's, it's kind of like I, I don't use a recipe approach. You know, two cups, Netflix, three cups, uh, Facebook, you know, two teaspoons, fuel, because it's a volatile stock, anyways. You know, so I, I just so there is so that's all to say. I use the ugly duckling theory. It's more a state of a, a state of mind, more an approach based on watching the stocks, and less freaking out over the indexes. Although they are getting weaker and they look pretty trashy right now. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? <clears throat> oh, uh, wait a minute. What is this? This is the Nasdaq. Don't look at that quote window back there. That's uh, that's my top secret buy short list. Uh, let's see, GLD, gold. Gold is trying to push higher. It's stalling a little bit. My only question here is, okay, you actually had a uh, pocket pivot here, which would have been, what, last Friday? And then you gap down. I figured, it, though, on the GLD, 119 would be support. That was a low here, 119.11. You came into 119.23 here and then 119.17. So that held, also held the 20-day exponential. And then you get a gap up that's another pocket pivot up off the 50-day, but also going through the 65-day. 
it looks to me like gold wants to go higher. And, you know, it's just still in this long-term... Yeah, uh, and you know what's interesting about... Um, you know, Dr. K, why don't you talk about this for a second? Uh, I got somebody... Say what's interesting I got the, about the uh, UPS at the door. I got to pick up something real quick, okay? So talk about... You can talk about... Okay, yeah, gold. go for it. I was going to say, um, what's interesting, well, I'll first talk about GLD um, and SLV. Uh, we know that SLV, the silver equivalent, tends to be two to four times as volatile. And you can see that um, it's... Uh, Fallen quite, uh, you know, quite a bit more. Uh, Thirty-eight percent uh, versus twenty. Well, off its absolute peak, it's it fallen quite a bit more than gold. Um, and so, if gold is really turning a corner here and finding its floor, then silver will as well. And what's interesting is, is um, if you look at the Commodity uh, Research Bureau index. Actually, when Kiel comes back, you can pull up the chart. But um, the CRB index is uh, looks to me like it's finding its floor. Um, it's retested uh, lows and three times, actually four, four times, and each time it uh, it, it doesn't really um, it, it tends to be um, cleaning up its volatility. So the volatility in the pattern is is, is lessening, and uh, of course we know that's a that's a good sign that, it, that the floor might be genuine. Um, and of course, for those who don't know, the CRB um, is comprised of uh, 17 uh, commodities. I'm back. Commodities. So it represents the commodities market and overall. Uh, uh, 50,000 foot view of the overall commodities market. Yeah, I was just saying, um, talking about the CRB index and oh. on the weekly chart, it's, it looks like it's finding its uh, its floor. It keeps retesting and then uh, doesn't go a whole lot lower. So the volatility is with that. What would be the best ETF for tracking that? Um, let me see. There's a, there's a few. Actually, I, I use the Wanda one. So, but um, in general, there are. Let me see here. I've got a whole bunch of these. There, um, okay. Try, try. No, 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 not that one. I mean, the DVD try, um, is one. <laughs> try, try. That's a, that Moo is the agricultural. Um, Moo. Okay. It's an agri. Oh agri my God, index. that looks terrible. What's going on there? And then, oh wait, you know what you do? Uh, it's DBA. That's it. DBA is also a, another. Wait, that doesn't look good. <laughs> These are agricultural ETFs, and right, DBC is really, I think, the one you're looking at. It's trying to cover uh, you know it's what? Not you know what um, all of them. Yeah, it's interesting because um, the Ro Jimmy Rogers has an um, index because he follows commodities quite closely, and uh, yes, yeah, the Rogers International Commodity Index, and it's got all the major commodities in it, and so the ticker there is RJA, and on the weekly it looks like it's still in a steady downtrend. You can draw a line through Which, that. Uh, uh, what's the symbol so, again? RJA. Okay. On the weekly, and it looks like you could just draw a line through that uh, that, that that pattern. Um, Going lower. So the question like is, is it really finding its floor um, here? This is why it's good to look at other. You know, um, I suppose you could make the argument that the that the CRB index, if you just go from uh, September 2012 to present, it's still in a downtrend. Right. So you know, it's important to like these are very subtle distinctions, but. It is uh, on its side is gold, which uh, looks like it may be turning a corner um, at last. And so if that does, and it's probably bodes well for um, all these other indices. Yeah, I'd be happy with that if it wants to go uh, go higher. Um, of course, you know it's nice being in the comfortable position of having bought your pile of gold when it was under three hundred. So I hate to be somebody uh, buying gold on the basis of those silly commercials where they tell you protect your IRA with gold. Exactly. How does that one work? What if, what if gold declines by 50%? How does that protect your IRA? I don't get it. But the commercials are what they are, and there's a lot of BS out there. Um, anyways, Dr. K, here's a question for you. Is the currency crisis in Argentina related to QE in the U.S.? Are the ill effects of QE beginning to surface? Well, we know that uh, the problems with QE is, is that when central banks print money, it devalues their currency. And the smaller the economy, uh, the more prone that economy is to um, creating problems for its currency. You know, we've seen this in Yugoslavia. We've seen this in uh, a, a number of, you know, Menem's uh, Chile. We, we've seen a lot of these um, countries that were smaller um, economic uh, ecosystems, and they printed themselves, they printed their currency out of existence. So um, I would say, yeah, I mean, if the central bank has problems, you know, shoring up its currency, it's printed too much, and it 
it's it devalues, it, it, it's, unsettled, it's unsettling and destabilizing to the economy because it also has the effect of wiping out the middle class. Um, and the middle class is uh, any economy's uh, stable unit. So if the middle class is starting to erode, and that we're seeing this in the U.S. and the U.K. and in European countries, um, with all, they're all debtor nations, and um, that's going to down the line create uh, social unrest as the uh, instability um, grows. I noticed the dollar gapping down yesterday, which is interesting. That's helping to drive that. That drove the the moving gold, obviously. But interesting stocks down, dollar down, gold up, silver up, um, silver up, and nickel. It's not really moving. I noticed uh, in the, in the uh, Paper market, silver is priced at $20 an ounce. If you go on to kitco.com, for example, and you try to buy a silver coin, one ounce silver coin, it's going to cost you $24.10 unless you buy the 25th anniversary Canadian Maple Leaf silver one ounce coin, which is going to cost you $25.10. But um, at least that was last night. <clears throat> Maybe those prices are a little bit higher this morning. But that's a 20% disconnect between the paper price, the spot price, and... Uh, physical prices for silver coins, which I think is very interesting. Anyways, I'm going to go through some questions. Somebody's wondering if HLF uh, Herbalife is a pod. I don't know where you see a pod here, unless you're thinking that it's a giant, <laughs> super giant pod. Let's see here. Um, to me, it's it's a big giant uh, formation. A pod is usually, you know, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 weeks or so long. It's a sharp up and down move. I think what you got going on here is possibly left shoulder ahead, and you formed a right shoulder. And now you're breaking down. So that's looking pretty grim. Um, and, but I don't think you're going to short it here. You're close to the 200 day. You're close to there. It's also very news oriented. I I. Uh, Leave it alone, JT. I mean, if you shorted it uh, the other day, right at the 50-day, you're golden. But I think 10 points lower, you're a little bit on the late side. But, you know, put it on your short list. Keep an eye on it. CMG, awesome short last week. Yeah, and CMG was looking great. I mean, I don't know if that's an awesome short. Personally, I think if you had shorted NUS up here, this would be an awesome short. And it looks to me like it wants to go lower. But CMG, interestingly, uh, you know, was looking good. It was in IBD, you know, stock making a constructive base. Tries to break out, fails, and there it goes. So now, you know, perhaps this is a later stage uh, failed base here for the stock. So looking grim, down 206 on the down, SX down 74, pushing lower. Um, so we've moved a fair bit lower since we started this webinar, which I told you... Uh, at the start of this webinar, I just short the crap out of this market. Uh, somebody says, what a joke. That is on the TD article. Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting that you have a front page article about, uh, you know, the TD Ameritrade CEO all, all giddy over the fact that the individual investor is coming back. Maybe a sign of a top. Um, the wedging pocket pivot worked on QCore so far. Um, there was no, I, I wouldn't really call this a wedging rally beforehand. You actually were picking up some volume, hung out, and then it went higher. So that one's working. But it's less less of a, you did see some pickup in volume here as you came up. So, but yeah, they can work or maybe not work. And if you want to test them, you, you do so, uh, you know, with the, with the uh, right stop in place. Triple D, uh, this is, I guess, an exercise in the obvious. Uh, breaking down, stocks had a big run, you know, so I'm not, I wouldn't touch it. I'm not really interested. How long do you bake your Netflix before it's toast? Um, I'm thinking if it goes through the high of the day, I'm, I'm out. But my thinking is it's going to come down, so it could be a, you know, scalper. We'll see. I could be wrong. Um, is there a VIX for gold? Huh? I mean, a volatility indicator for I don't know. CRBQ? This is a stock that trades by appointment, I think. It trades like 9,000 shares a day. So not really sure that this is anything I would be interested in uh, playing with. But what is this? The CRB? Oh, wait a minute. Is this a CRB? Yeah, it's a, yeah there it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, global commodity. Yeah, I guess. Is this what you're talking about, Dr. K, where you have these lows? Yeah, exactly. So it seems like it's rounding out. It's mirroring the CRB uh, to some extent, yeah. 
Um, you know, the thing with this is uh, it's thin, but there is arbitrage going on being an ETF. So I would test test it to see uh, that you you know make sure you're not moving the price around if you're going to buy um, right. a sizable. Yeah. But the uh, markets are made in these yes differently from stocks. So even though it's thin, you sometimes can buy say eight thousand shares, and not move the price. Yeah. But test it yeah. test it out with a small number of shares first. Buy generic silver. It's cheaper. Somebody says. Yeah, but the other issue is uh, if you're buying cheesy uh, coins or cheesy silver bars. Uh, Sometimes the, the the intent, in my view, the reason you want to own gold and silver in physical form is as a hedge against some sort of currency crisis. What is that, Dr. K? We got water pressure problems, so then you're coming in and out. I see. Um, anyways, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but you have to think about th th that as well in terms of uh, you know how how readily accepted is it, and so there is an issue with. Uh, certain like my like Kitco, I know produces its own little bars which are cheaper and uh, but they tell you you got to keep them in the in the packaging otherwise it, you, they, people may not accept them as readily. So my view is just you know silver eagles are fine, um, and and the reason you're owning it is for a uh, a hedge against the currency crisis, which I think is coming someday, but maybe that's not till I die, in which case it really doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, who was it that said in the long run we're all dead? Was that for another Baruch uh, thing? Uh, Gil, which cookies are best for the toss? I like organic gluten-free chocolate chip. Hmm. I don't know if that's all that funny, but uh, the cookie toss is what I refer to as the morning sell-off that you'll see occasionally and the market grinds its way back higher. It's kind of like if you ever, you know, I remember when I was 20, on my 21st birthday, I ate a lot, a lot of pizza and we did tequila shots, big mistake. And uh, the world was, was spinning in a variety of uh, rotational directions uh, at that point for me. But once I puked it all out, I felt much better. And, and so that's what the market kind of does. You know, it does a cookie toss. It pukes in the morning, and then it's able to move higher. So I hope the uh, chainsaws aren't coming through on the microphone uh, because it's not all right. the house behind us, there's like a bunch of guys, they look like uh, big squirrels all running around in the trees, cutting down all the branches, so as long as I keep them on their side of the fence. Anyways, uh, let's see, HDS, a good remodeling play? I don't know, I don't think in terms of, of plays, you know, over, it's like, oh, here's a remodeling, I'm going to buy a stock because uh, there's a remodeling craze and I'm just going to buy this and, and is it a good play? I don't know. It's a very loose. Here's a weekly chart, so this thing's trying to, uh, you know, form a base. But I don't really see anything setting up in here. Um, so I, I, I'm not really my cup of tea. You know, big earnings, but it's I don't know. So it I, I don't I don't think so. Anyways. Um, that was my 21st birthday, Scott. That was a tequila shot. Okay, let's see. Any other? Do we have more questions here? Um, everybody's just sitting there like a deer in headlights, looking at their positions going lower, right? Is that what's going on? Uh, let's see. I noticed, well, not, it's not holding up anymore, but Twitter tried to hold the 10-day, uh, 20-day confluence here. Um, yesterday on the pullback, it's hanging out, but this, this could go either way. It really depends on what the market's going to do. And I think uh, right now we're, we're just continuing lower and volume is picking up. Dr. K, was the Argentinian currency crisis noticed before today? What are the chances of spreads like in 1998? Well, I haven't looked into it in that, in, in to that uh, degree, um, so I, I can't answer the question yet. But uh, I'll, I'll look into it in more depth. But I, you know, I don't think it's, we're going to have another 1998 situation. At least, no, we need uh, to. We need to get Alex Marenko here. Alex, uh, I remember, was oh, yeah. a, he was an uh, Argentinian native, uh, came here, uh, I think, 20 years ago, and uh, started working at, as, he used to be Mr. Argentina, uh, bodybuilding champion, and uh, came to the U.S. Uh, about 20 years ago, I guess. Um, hope I got that right. But uh, he's from Argentina originally, so he's uh, very well versed in what's going on in Argentina. His whole family's back there. He was a he uh, met Bill O'Neill at the gym. 
because he was teaching at the gym where O'Neill uh, was working out every every day, and uh, he met Bill, and then Bill brought him on as a portfolio manager, and I was entrusted with the task of uh, training him. So, why, why? Uh, what about why, why here? Yeah, actually, and, and, and just real quick on Argentina, um, yeah. you know, they, everyone should know that its uh, its inflation rates expected to top thirty percent, but um, know that the uh, well, yeah, the hard currency dropped, uh, the reserves of hard currency dropped 30% last year. It seems like this problem has been ongoing. Um, so, you know, uh, it's interesting. I don't know if it's going to accelerate. I'm going to take a look in more detail. But, uh, you know, Argentina's had, had problems for a while. And, and this is just, you know, an, an potentially, you know, the c continuation of its downtrend. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't sound good. So it doesn't seem like the rest it's of the world is not good. Happen. I don't know if it's going to accelerate and get, you know, like 1998. Um, there's, there's no real talk about that yet, but uh, I'll look around. Um, <clears throat> you know, someone asked, what about why, why here? What, is, what does that mean? Does that mean, are we supposed to say, uh, yes, just buy it here. It's fine. It could come all the way back down to 54. So if you want to sit through 10% of downside, uh, go for it. But I can't tell you if this is going to turn. I'm not really looking at buying anything yet. You know, I'm just kind of hanging out. I've got a couple of shorts out here. I'm up a little bit on them right now. Uh, nothing to really write home about, but, you know, a couple bucks, three, four, five bucks, whatever. Uh, and that works for right now. We'll see what happens. But uh, I'm not really interested in buying anything. If I see something coming down like that, you know, I, don't, I, don't just, I can't tell you whether you can buy this here or not. And if you think I can, then you're... you're uh, you are hopelessly misguided. Uh, neither can Dr. K, I don't think. Dr. K, can you determine whether someone could just step in and buy YY here? <laughs> yeah, part of part of good investing is knowing that a lot of times, most times the stock's not touchable. Only only critical pivot right. points is where you want to really be uh, putting your money on the line. Right. I mean, I think the only way I would step in here, first of all, you pull back to the 10-day, look like you were going to hold, didn't happen. Of course, you didn't have a continuation pocket pivot off the 10-day. So you go lower, you try to hold the 20-day, here and didn't happen going lower and uh, yeah so where is it going to stop I don't know I'm not willing to step in and uh, try and be a hero here so if you think you can be go for it um, let's see could you explain what a pod is that you discussed well you can read chapter six of our book you know, I don't know if I really have time to explain a pod other than the, the fact that it's a uh, it's a stock that goes straight down and straight up and then becomes shortable on that basis. I think, uh, I don't know if this goes back far enough. I mean, I think you have to read our book. If you haven't read it, then I would suggest reading it. And you'll get a full explanation of pods. I don't really have time to uh, go into an explanation of what a pod is. Uh, da, 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 let's see. Gil, what market volume are you looking at to determine if, if there is selling pressure? Trying to understand how to determine if market is likely hitting low or possible rebound. Huh? What market volume? I'm not really watching market volume. I'm watching uh, individual stocks and that's pretty much pretty much it. I, I, I mean, if things look ugly to me and look shortable, then I'm going to hit them on the short side, but I'm not, to me it looks like you're just coming lower, so I, you know, and the volume I'm looking at is if you check IBD's uh, web page showing right now, investors.com, 12.59 percent increase in volume on the NYC, 8.61 on the NASDAQ, so. Have you looked back at the 99 to 2000 time period for flurries of pocket pivots like we had earlier this month? I guess what the question is asking yeah. is whether you go back to that period. Were there a lot of pocket pivots occurring? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's great. Part of my research was to go back many decades and look at different market periods, market cycles, and see how pocket pivots fared. So was and, there an abnormal uh, you know, increase in pocket pivots? It was like candy from a baby. I mean, I, I wish I knew then what I know now. You know, I wish I had pocket pivot. I figured out pocket pivots in 2005. I wish I'd figured them out in 1996. <laughs> and then my percent, you know, the returns that have been even more, more. I mean, it, it's mind mind boggling. Um, 
you know, being able to do that back then. And I'm, I'm, what I'm hoping at some point, you know, markets will restore their back to a, you know, the markets always return back to some sort of um, tradition. And you know, if you can look back over 100 years, and you get periods where the markets are very favorable, and you get periods where pocket pivots are extremely favorable. Um, in the 20s, you know, you had a lot of pocket pivot buy, buying opportunities, and so I'm, I, I can't wait for that kind of market to return. Because instead of a say a, a triple digit percentage return like you know 100 to 200 percent in a year, there's no reason why they couldn't do you know be doing upwards of 500 to 1,000 percent. Yeah, and I don't know if the question is is to uh, ask whether there are a lot of pocket pivots around uh, 99 2000, and that indicated the top. Because if there were a bunch in 99, then you wanted to be long those things. And yeah. uh, you would have made a lot of money. So is, it's, if you're asking whether the, the fact that there were a lot of pocket pivots meant you were near a top, I don't really think that's really the right <laughs> way to correct. look yeah. at it. When you get yeah. a lot of pocket pivots, that's a buying opportunity you should buy. You, should, you, should you buy them. Fully yeah. you, don't, you don't sit and, there and go, and oh, then, there's then, a lot. The market corrects. The, 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 when, when we had that top in March, um, then the pocket pivots dried up after that top. So right. you know, there was no indication that... The indication that the market was topping in March was the price volume action of leading stocks and the major averages together, right. taken as a whole. Um, I think collectively as a group, um, you know, for O'Neill, we were all out of the market within four days. I was out in three, back completely to cash, um, starting to sell on the second day and then back into cash third third day. So, you know, you had to be really quick because the markets are very volatile, you know, obviously off a, off a major top like that. Right, and you have no idea what you know, what if it signals something, you know, again, this is like you're looking for the holy grail, like there's some magic overriding indicator that means the market is going to top and you can time it exactly. The bottom line is, if I was worried about the fact that there were too many pocket pivots in late 1999, you know, I was up 32% by October, by the end of the year I was up over a thousand. So, you know, it's a meaningless thing. And to even waste your time wondering, well, were there a lot of pocket pivots in 99 or 2000? And did that mean a top? It's like you, you've got your head in the wrong place. And you're, you're wondering, you're trying to find some holy grail, some magic indicator that is going to tell you exactly when a market top is going to occur. And, and that just doesn't exist. You play the uptrend until it's over. Um, you know, as uh, Ed Sakota said, uh, the trend is your friend until it bends at the end. And uh, that's basically uh, the deal. But, you know, trying to come up with some magic indicator like whether, you know, the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter is aligned with Mars and there's too many pocket pivots isn't going to tell you anything about the general market trend. When you see pocket pivots in a particular stock, uh, you know, such as YY, I thought the great pocket pivot there was right in the base right here. And you could have got in, you had some time to get in, and then kaboom, you're off to the races. And I think that was really, <clears throat> you know, that was the, the one to buy. If there was like 50 other pocket pivots at the same time, what difference does it make? None. So, again, you know, people need to get away from this idea of trying to find uh, some holy grail magic indicator that's going to tell you when you're at the beginning or the end of a, of a rally. I mean, if you come out of a, a, a correction, and we saw this in 2010, if you come out of a, a correction and you're starting, the market's starting to, bounce along the lows and chop around the lows and uh, you're starting to see a lot of pocket pivots within bases it can generally uh, be a sign that the market's going to get ready to turn here um, and I remember when I was on Fox Business News on August 29th 2010 everybody there was I think I talked about this last time everybody there was pretty bearish but if you recall Dr. K we were seeing a lot of pocket pivots showing up That's right. at that time and so that was telling us you know after market correction that we were starting to turn. Um, you know, whether you see a bunch at a top doesn't really, isn't really relevant to me or not. Anyways, somebody says. I want to make a comment on um, on, uh, on Latin America again, and and um, it's interesting. I just, just bumped into this article about um, well, essentially, the upshot is this: if as long as these central banks continue to print, the major central banks like the Fed, the Bank of England, and the ECB, and they're printing like there's no tomorrow, and as long as that continues. And, and for now, it seems like it will continue into the extended future. Right. Um, then that fuels, uh, or it's a stabilizer for the for the global economy. It's artificially done, but it's nevertheless a stabilizer. So if Argentina has another 1998, it's it's going to be contained to Argentina. It's not going to be spreading. Um, 
Now, if, of course, as central banks uh, start to taper, that could create a serious problem, and the question is how they're going to do it and when they're going to do it. Based on what Bernanke has said, they're not going to be tapering for a long time to come. I mean, they will be tapering. Let me get this straight. They're going to taper, but they're going to keep our interest rates at artificially low levels for an extended period, meaning they're going to figure out other ways to print money. And I think that's true with central banks around the world. So that bodes well for stocks. It bodes well for, you know, for keeping uh, basically a safety net under, uh, under stocks for the time being. Theoretically, yeah. So Theoretically. <laughs> Until you, see you, know, you just watch the stocks. Stock. You don't worry about, you know, you don't come up with some, I mean, I would say the same thing about that, okay, to say that, oh, well, don't worry, QE is going to be there. So you don't have to watch your stuff. Just buy everything when it's down every time. And but there are, but we know, Dr. K, there are some conditions that seem to occur when the market does bottom out. So you, I think you have to be open-minded about that. But at the same time, don't Absolutely. be blind, and stick to uh, to stick to your stops. So don't get don't get used to don't don't become habit forming. Don't let this form bad habits of expecting the market to find its floor. You have to see critical evidence and price volume action every time. Right. Otherwise, and that, that's how the market direction model does function. I mean, it, yes, it's, it's allow, allowing greater bandwidth, greater movement in the stocks before it switch out to, switches out of its buy signal. But, but the moment it, it starts to really see some a change in the way things have been, then it will uh, it will be exiting its position and most likely into a more of a sell signal. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that that it, how does that work? Well, if the market say falls uh, five or six percent. And uh, and then has a weak balance. I mean, there's many ways this can this can play out, but it's always looking for buying and selling pressure. And it, right now, it's looking for abnormal selling pressure, um, abnormal based on the QE environment we're in, um, especially since January 2nd of 2013. We're right. in a full-blown QE environment, so it's going to look for something that's outside that norm since January 2nd. Yeah, so far the market doesn't seem to want to rally. Any other questions? Somebody says, uh, thanks for the session on Monday. HGS is proving to be an invaluable tool. Well, that's good to hear. I, I like it. I mean, I use it. It's my, it's my main squeeze uh, these days. I mean, it, it's funny, Dr. K, I used to spend my weekends on Wanda. You know, now I spend my weekends on HGS Investor, so things have shifted uh, considerably in terms of the tools that I'm using. And, uh, you know, I just go with what's working for me. Anyways, uh, Dr. K, have you, have you studied stocks that show relative strength and rise when the market falls as potential leaders when the uptrend resumes? I think... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, that's, well, that's I think O'Neill already, already pointed that out a few hundred times in his book. Um, but sure, very stocks critical. that are shown, holding up better are always the stronger stocks. Duh. <laughs> And I, I think everyone should make a study of it, of it themselves because, you know, the, in other words, I, I'm a big believer and don't take the other person's word for it. If it sounds reasonable, if there's sound logic to it, then test it out yourself because then it becomes yours. Exactly. You really start to understand it. Wow, look at this. Some of these stuff. I'm going to go through some of these names that are just getting cratered here. Um, Cree was a nice uh, one-day wonder. And I'm glad I had bought some of that, and I just blew it out at the opening right away. It gapped down. I was gone. And look at that thing now. I'm gl glad I uh, exited the stage right on that one. Um, Yelp is coming off, you know, right at the down to the 20-day. If you got a reference point on it at the 20-day, maybe that's a place you could try and buy it. But, you know, I'd be careful. I think this needs to play out a little bit longer, you know. That said, I can't tell you for sure. But it does look dangerous, and if you're getting whacked on your names, uh, that that tells you something as well. So, Dr. K, looks like you're giving a lot of room for the indexes before switching the MDM. No change in the perspective now. No, not not yet. No, um, I'm, well, I'm giving more room than I would normally just to prevent getting whipsawed. But uh, that doesn't mean just be, let's say the markets go off seven percent. That doesn't mean there's going to be a change out of the buy signal. It could be that uh, the buy signal comes on a bounce. You know, it can happen a number of ways. So, in other words, if you're worried about giving back too much um, in a 3x ETF you're holding, yeah, you should position size accordingly. A 7% drop in the indices is a 21% drop in your ETF, and that might be too much for what you're willing to, to lose. So, you should position size it accordingly to that. Not that we're going to give back 7%, but I'm saying, you know, always, always uh, be uh, be um, cognizant of uh, of these ETFs and how far they can run. Uh, here's Cena. Here's an example. You had a pocket pivot here. It tried to break out and it failed pretty quickly. In my view, if you come in and buy the stock, you know, when it starts to break down, it's starting to look pretty ugly. And HGS Investor Software is flashing a bunch of red signals on my indicator bars. 
and you had a gap down through the 50-day, so this thing becomes a late-stage fail base. You get a little rally. Notice how it comes down to the 150-day exponential, and then it rolls over again and eats it pretty nicely. Um, that's that's a sign of one. You know, I noticed Baidu, another one, has broken down through the 50-day moving average, finds resistance at the 65-day exponential. Uh, Amazon has been trying to act pretty well, but now it looks like it's starting to fail. And that seems a little odd to me. I don't know why that's going on. It was acting well, but I guess that's what happens with everything. The other big NASDAQ sucks to see Priceline trying to pull into the top of its space. So far, that looks okay. Google getting tagged down to the 20-day. It has tested it before, so we'll see if this holds. If it doesn't, then maybe look out below. Um, Apple. Every day there's someone else saying something about Apple. Carl Icahn's got it moving recently with comments about how he bought another five hundred million dollars worth of the stock I guess which I suppose is wonderful news and everybody should jump in and buy the stock on that basis but uh, I'm not I think in general stocks building a base on the weekly chart down here you can see that and I don't know maybe it's gonna go higher maybe not earnings come out next week I'm not willing to, to uh, play earnings roulette on that this one um, Wow, here's a long, I'm going to read this, so this is a really long. You guys do an amazing job on the webinars, but I only have one suggestion, and this is not a complaint. Gil's trading style is just too aggressive for many of us, as he has the ability to go from a fully invested position on margin to a net short portfolio in a matter of a few days. A few days? No, more like a few seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe less while breaking his capital in just a few stocks. Many of us need at least 15 to 20 stocks to get to a fully invested portfolio. And on top of that, we are trend followers, following a set of buy and sell rules, which I think is more in line with how Dr. K trades. Well, you know, O'Neill's rules were uh, that you don't, you don't own 15 to 20 stocks, and that's too many stocks to own, and you really want to own, you know, three to five. So I'm actually more in touch with that than I would have to say. And the idea of having 10 to 20 positions or 15 to 20 positions that you have to have, I think, is a, a flawed assumption. So, you know, I think there's a lot more people who trade like I do. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. Than, I mean, keep... than, than who, you know, oh. my 15 to 10, and they're O'Neill-style traders. I think it's very, uh, you know, very unusual for somebody who's an O'Neill-style trader. And I don't think you can do it in this market. Do you, Dr. K? Yeah, O'Neill... O'Neill and I used to have this um, friendly debate, and uh, it was about you know his his view that I was holding too many stocks. And I said, well, this works for my ADHD. It works for my brain. It's wired weird. And I said, I agree that most people aren't going to be able to track this many names, but my my brain loves it. And um, you know, I remember by 1999, he told me he's you know he said this is great. Trade, just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, I kept getting the highest returns, and he said, yeah, it just it works for you. Great, keep keep going. But I, I think that for most people. You know, unless that's your trading personality, don't try to do what I'm doing because it, it's going to uh, end up costing you money. And I would say, um, you know, O'Neill's style is much more in keeping with with um, um, uh, uh, the style of having to focus on just a handful of names. You know, watch a few eggs in your basket very, very closely, and then um, I think a lot of people are going to do better that way than trying to, you know, track 15 names at once. And keep in mind that when I was doing that, I was glued to my screens all day um, and enjoying it. I mean, I just the, the trading day is six and a half hours, and it would go by in the blink of an eye to me. But to other people, um, it would be burdensome, you know. And if, if you're if you're doing this day in day out, and it, you're you're it's becoming um, a chore, you're going to burn out. And and so even if it works in the beginning, it might not work in the end. So keep all that in mind, and uh, adapt your your to your you know your trading style should be something that you find up for yourself, and you know. Maybe you're the type who wants to ha you know, handle three or five names. Maybe you're the type who wants more than, more than ten, but you have to find that. You have to find this stuff. It's a self-discovery process for every investor. And I would actually say, Dr. K, that your method in 99 was actually uh, underperformed my three to four stock portfolio, which was up over 1,000% in 1999. <laughs> so I would counter that. My view, counter that. My view that's, that's an argument for uh, focusing on the very best stocks and, and rocking I, I can counter that very easily. And you know that I was actually had the highest return of the big account that I was running doing that method of 16 stocks. 
I think it was up 581 percent. Yes, but you're and you you're, were up a lot, but you were up. I remember something like 520 something, and I remember you were on my heels the whole time. Right. But you know, but yeah, I mean, again, it's it's. Uh, I think we're splitting hairs. Yeah, but the other thing is, my personal account at that time was the same size as the amount of money you were running for O'Neill. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I, but as you know, as I mean, you I'm know, just that's making a the point idea. that I think you can I love this tell debate. me. 15 to 20 stocks is a great way to go, but you know what? You better have the, the right environment for it because as far as I'm concerned, in this environment, 15 to 20 stocks is a great recipe to go nowhere. Seriously. Right, of course. I mean, this is the wrong environment for it, but, right. but actually I want to counter that one. <laughs> this, is, this is fun. <laughs> um, you actually kept bugging O'Neill to give me a lot more money because I had so That's much right. Well, I think if you're like, doing well, you, you deserve it versus some of the other guys who were up 15% and thinking they were – you know, the hottest thing on the planet. Uh, yeah, David, not, not mentioning any names, actually. Right. We, <laughs> we know who those people were. But anyway. What is your regular trading? Dr. K, what is your regular trading style versus Gills? You didn't, didn't say what it is at the beginning. Everybody wants you to go into some detailed uh, thing about how you trade and, and divulge your algorithm, Dr. K. Have you, <laughs> first of all, if you haven't, I divulge it in our books, but I also divulge it in the FAQs. And uh, the short long of it is that um, instead of what I tend to do is I, I tend to go in during good markets, and this would mean not this one. So in good markets, I would go in with, say, 25% positions and find myself on full margin fairly quickly spread across eight stocks. That would be my base. And then as any, any, any new stock that would emerge that looked better, um, I, would, I would buy that, but I can't go more than 200% long, so I would then cut back on my weakest two positions, or I would sell one position not right. So what would happen in time over the over the weeks is that my position of eight on full margin would expand to typically anywhere between 12 to 16 names. So it's a very organic, dynamic process where the market's telling me what stocks to buy and what stocks to sell within my own portfolio. There you have it. I hope that does that does that tell everybody. Let's see. But read the FAQs if you want to. Yeah. That's basically what the FAQ show. And then, the, of course, our books have a lot more detail. Looks like someone says, looks like Citron is going after uh, 3D stocks again today. Still amazed they can have so much influence. Yeah, I, I know that. Um, they're out there slamming uh, 3D stocks today. So, yeah, the market's trying to, trying to show, find its feet. So you notice we come down into this area here of uh, resistance or, uh, or support actually right on top of except for the S&P over here and uh, the NASDAQ comes down into this area of uh, possible support and they're trying to bounce them off of here so kind of interesting Uh, let's see. If GoGo continues to hold a mid low twenty three level, do you like it here? I don't. You know, I, I don't know what to say about GoGo. Um, to me, it looked like it should have should have turned. It's floundering about here, so I'm not. I don't really like it here, or dislike it. I'm not really uh, looking to. Uh... ENT is doing a lot better by comparison. Yeah. Hilarious. These guys behind the backyard are singing. Also, Gogo has a flaw in its pattern on that gap down um, on December 18th. Mm -hmm. So it's got to do some good work before uh, it becomes actionable again. <laughs> I'm just listening to these guys outside. Fuel. Fuel got spanked yesterday, so I don't really like it. It gapped up. It should have, should have taken off. Should have run, but it didn't. Um, so I'm not really uh, not really a player there. <clears throat> Thin stock, Splunk uh, coming in. It's just pulled back to the 10-day moving average. So to me, neither here Splunk's nor there. Splunk's pulling up pretty well, actually, compared to a lot of these other names. Um, and it's got an interesting uh, business model. So. Yeah, interesting technology. So yeah, I keep. I actually have a position in this one, so I'm just sitting and. Yeah, and it's right it's pulling back into the ten day, so nothing you know really abnormal there. Let's see. 
Gil, say you have a buy list of 15 stocks, but since you only buy a handful at one time, how do you decide which of the 15 to buy first? First out of the gate, pure technical action? Well, I, I consult with my astrologist and show her the list and then have her uh, roll the bones and see which ones they land on. I just watch them open up. You know, if I think they're in a spot to buy, I buy them. And uh, it's just kind of watching what they're doing and seeing if that... Uh, you know, that, that doesn't cause uh, one or the other to outperform. And, and I, I don't know, I just, you know, to me it's watching the tape and then moving on the tape when it looks right, you know. So I can't, couldn't really tell you that uh, it's all about ranking them or, or uh, having some you know, special technique for calling them out. I just go in there and... Uh, and watch them act and, and how they act once they start trading. And if I think they look good, I'll uh, I'll jump on them. <laughs> it's pretty much that simple. Let's watch this mark right now. We're getting to the end of the, it's 9.02 right now. Let's see, Solar City. I'm going to run through some quick things and we're going to sign off. Uh, let's see, Solar City pull back to the 10 day, so that's what's going on. You know, so if you're going to buy the pullbacks to the moving averages, I guess you can do that and uh, give that a whirl. I don't, you know, but the, you're probably using the low of the day as a stop or whatever other you know uh, reference point you want to give it. Tesla, you had the breakout. That was the time to be buying it. Now it's just kind of pulling back. I'm kind of amazed that it's come all the way back up to its highs. Maybe this turns into a pot. I don't know. I don't think you'll know for sure until after earnings. So, anyways. Let's see. Vips. Well, Vips, you know, looking hot. Pulls back to the roughly top of the base in the 20-day moving average. Maybe it's going to go higher. Uh, maybe not. But it's a very volatile stock, so I don't really even deal with it. How is Kihu... Would you hold it now with a 0% cushion or a 0 cushion? I don't know. It's, if you're buying it down in here, you're still okay. But, uh, you know, I, don't, if, I wouldn't even want to own it myself. So, you yeah, know, that's just me. Um, but, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's heavy selling in here. It looks a little funky to me. So, Anyway, so that's really all I have. You know, we'll just see how this market pans out um, one way or the other. So I'm not really leaning too hard one way or the other, and we'll just see what happens. We're down here pretty good on the indexes, but we'll see if uh, we don't find some support here and try to bounce. So anyway, I would just keep an open mind and watch stocks coming into support. So if you see something pulling in, I can't tell you whether you should buy something here and it's going to go up. All you can do is test it. And see if that works. And if it doesn't, you know, then you're out of the stock hopefully pretty quickly. But in my view, uh, you know, if you're going to test some of these pullbacks, then you better figure out what you're going to use as your stop and operate uh, accordingly. So, you know, that's all I would say. Anything else, Dr. K? I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Let's just uh, keep an eye on things and see where they go. All right. Sounds good. We'll catch you guys later. Take care. So long, everyone.